I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce you to this course on nuclear science and technology with an emphasis on the use of nuclear energy to produce electricity. But let's begin by talking about energy. The first segment of these remarks are based largely on thoughts first expressed by Richard Smalley, recipient of the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1996. He summarized humanity's top 10 problems for the next 50 years. He would often ask his students and his audiences the question, what are humanity's top 10 problems for the future? What do you think they are? Here are the items in Smalley's list in alphabetical order. Please take a moment to select your choice of the top problems. Let's see what you all think. In Smalley's survey, the word energy usually came out on top. Solving the energy problem means that we have abundant energy available in the amounts we need universally around the planet at a low enough cost that we can do the things that we need to do during these 50 years for the billions of people on the planet. Right now we have about 7 billion people on the planet and the expectation is that we will have between 9 and 10 billion by 2050. The challenge with that number of people on the sphere is to provide the technology base to allow these human beings to live a reasonably fulfilled life. If we don't provide enough energy, the world may become a rather mean place to live. That's the challenge we're facing today. I think most people would agree that if energy is the number one problem, then water is number two. Water is a great example of the importance of energy. Water is a very brutal problem. Either you have it or you don't. If you haven't got it, then you have to get it. Luckily, we have plenty of water on the planet, but it has salt in it, and it's often thousands of miles away from where you need it. We know how to take the salt out of water. You boil it. Boiling works okay, but it takes energy to boil water. And for the amount of water that we need, it's a vast amount of energy. Then you need to transport it thousands of miles away to where it will be used. There's energy needed to pump it. There's energy required to manufacture the materials and so forth to build a pipeline. But if you've got the energy, you can solve the water problem. If you have it, then you can't. Number three, food. Clearly, with that number of people on the planet, food is a huge problem. For the food problem, Smalley's answer was, see number two, water. Once again, you're only going to solve the problem with energy. Of course, it's more complicated than that. You need to have good soil. You need to have a reasonable climate to grow those things. But if worse comes to worse, we could make greenhouses on a vast scale. Once again, it's a vast energy intensive operation to build just the greenhouses and let alone service them. But if you have the energy, you can do it. Let's do a quick run through of the others in the top 10. Number four, environment. Most of our environmental problems come directly from the kind of energy we use and the way we use it. Number five, poverty. There is no single factor that determines economic well being of a civilization more than the availability, quality, and cost of its energy. Number six, terrorism and war. A lot of our wars, particularly recently, have been literally fought over energy. And future wars may be fought over water. Number seven, disease is dependent upon your food supply, your lifestyle, how clean your water supply is, and your access to modern health care, all of which are determined by your economic well-being. Number eight, education. Again, you can't bother too much with education if you can't eat and if you can't take care of yourself. But with prosperity, as civilization develops, you can take time for education. Number nine, democracy. That's a much more complicated question. It's not obvious you will solve a democracy problem with energy alone. But energy-induced prosperity, health, and education will certainly help. 
If there is an exception to all this, it's number 10, population. If you move the population issue to the top and you imagine that somehow this population problem is solved, then most of the other problems will go away. But how in the world did you imagine solving the population problem? If you can get population down to a level where we have enough energy for a prosperous, fulfilled lifestyle for all, we'd have to ask about five billion people to lead. So energy is unique, not only in being the most important problem to solve, but it, in its ability to enable solutions to the other problems. Because of this overriding importance of energy to the world, it's inevitable that a nuclear renaissance will happen. And this prediction was most eloquently expressed by John Rich, former director of the World Nuclear Association. Mr. Rich has given me permission to share excerpts of his remarks with you that underscore the compelling human dimensions of the global crisis we face. Viewed through history's eye, this success has come in a sudden burst. Through virtually all of the 50,000 years since humans first appeared, world population never exceeded 10 million. Then at some point within the last 2,000 years, something happened. To take a phrase from nuclear science, human inventiveness reached critical mass and advance led to advance at increasing speed. Within the last 2,000 years, as shown here, these gains in knowledge brought enlightenment and prosperity to hundreds of millions of people. But the surge of world population also carried a consequence. Before, humanity's effect on our Earth's ecosystems was like a flea on a camel, wholly inconsequential. This population crisis it bears emphasis, originates not in human evil, but in human success. Humanity's accumulating, accelerating success in acquiring, disseminating, and applying science-based knowledge. It's this success, taking form in agriculture, industry, commerce, and medicine, that has spawned the growth in human population and the gathering threat to our environment. Looking at Earth and humanity makes us humble to think that we are living in a great period of human history. But in just the last 200 years we call the Industrial Age, the time frame pictured in this slide, humanity became an influence on Earth's fundamental mechanisms. Now this impact threatens to destroy the very environmental conditions that enabled human success. Let's look at how the world's population developed. 2,000 years ago, the population was only 10 million. After another 1,000 years, the world's population had grown to 300 million. It took 50,000 years for population to reach 1 billion, a little more than a century to reach 2 billion, 33 years to reach 3 billion, 14 years to reach 4 billion, 13 years to reach 5 billion, 12 years to reach 6 billion. Today we are at 7 billion people, with most likely at least 9 billion projected by the year 2050. Viewing this population through an economic lens serves to describe the human condition. What we find is a world of extremes. At one end of the scale are the OECD Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development Countries where global prosperity is centered. These wealthy nations represent a mere one-sixth of humanity. At the other end are the world's poorest. Here an equal number of people, 1.1 billion, live in destitution with constant hunger, no clean water, virtually no income or prospect of improvement, and the death of a child every three seconds. Back at the wealthier end of the spectrum, if we add the 300 million semi-prosperous population of the former Soviet bloc, we find that 1.4 billion of the world's people, just over 20%, account for 80% of global economic consumption. 
That means that 80% of the world's people subsist on 20% of world production of goods and services. The 80% of humanity in the poor and developing world continues to increase. The rate is 20,000 a day. Think of it as the birth of a new city of 6 million people once each month. Our world's population is not shrinking. It's worsening by the day. The poorest 1.1 billion people are categorized as being in extreme poverty. Another 1.6 are classified as being in moderate poverty, just a small step above abject misery. They have little sanitation and virtually no money. They survive amidst pollution and disease. The energy dimension of poverty is fundamental. Poverty correlates so closely to the absence of electricity that access to electricity is the best single barometer to gauge a person's standard of living. In today's world of 7 billion, a full 2 billion people have no electricity, and 2 billion more have only limited access. In other words, fewer than 40% of the world's population can easily switch on the lights. Numbers on the same scale apply to clean water. Today, world water tables are falling under the demands of expanding human consumption and climate change. As this crisis emerges, we can expect the growing shortage of potable water supplies to produce thirst, disease, and water wars. In other words, a deadly combination of human suffering and human strife. As a remedy, we have only one available tool, large-scale desalination of seawater, an energy-intensive process that will compound global energy demand. Finally, we have the great mass of humanity positioned between poverty and prosperity. This population poised for advance will be the engine of our world's future economic development. In terms of future energy use, the human condition divides us into three categories. Those with energy access who will continue to use it. Those with none who desperately need it. And those poised in between whose drive for economic advance is producing expanded use of energy and with it an intensified outpouring of greenhouse emissions. Where are we going to get the energy the world will need? There are other sources of energy, and I believe we will need them all. Our challenge, the takeaway from this segment, the world's energy needs will be growing much more steeply from now than at any time since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. There is no doubt that we will need much more energy in 2050 than now. Where is this energy going to come from? You know energy sources may be split into three categories. Fossil fuels, renewable sources, and nuclear sources. The main fossil fuels are coal, petroleum, and natural gas. The main renewable energy sources are solar, wind, hydroelectric, and geothermal power. The nuclear-powered sources are fission and fusion. And my bottom line for this segment is a reasonable goal for 2050 is primarily a three-way mix of renewable energy, fossil fuels, and nuclear fission. By 2050, we will surely know more about such things as fusion, hydrogen, and the large-scale harvesting of renewable energy. Continual evaluation and adaptation are the keys to a more secure energy future. And for the world prosperity and peace, we have to make energy cheap. This notion of a three-way mix is a no-brainer. The debate will be on the contribution of each to the mix. The focus of this course is on nuclear. You may decide you like it or you may decide that the risk overwhelms the benefit. If you're interested in learning more about nuclear energy, I urge you to stay with this course.